and we're live and recording. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone here in the room, and welcome to Family and Friends Online. My name is Lucy Kirsten, I'm manager of the Center for Economic Transformation, and today we have a presentation by Sophia Manolis, a student from Stanford University. Uh, Sophia, exactly a year ago, you sent an email to Professor Willem von Linde. Um, if you could do some research on the impact of donor economics in Amsterdam. So we set up some meetings with Laurie De Vito, also a professor, and um, we had to write some invitation letters. You got your research questions really lined up. Um, you found and secured a great amount of funding over and do your research, which is a great compliment to you. And uh, after some formalities, uh, COVID restrictions, um, the international travel plan that we had to uh, sort of yeah. comply with. Um, you got in and you got your uh, UAS uh, email account and you went off and started your research. And the planning was a bit difficult because you came somewhere in June and start of July, everyone went on holiday, so there you were on your own. But I think this really is uh, uh, the way you work. You managed to get all your interviews lined up. You got into your research, and I think you are going to present us now with some really nice and exciting uh, results. Yeah. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, it's very independently you went on your way, and uh, you're going to talk about, I think, well, when it comes social and ideological tensions. Sounds very exciting. Uh, it's all about, I think, impact of local neighborhood cooperatives and food initiatives that you're going to research and the contributions to the change in Amsterdam uh, in relation to the donut economics. So we're greatly looking forward to your presentation and the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you to everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. It's super great to be here and finally get to talk about this. Um, so yeah, as Lucy said, I'm Sophia, and I'm going to be sharing a bit about the social and ideological tensions that I've observed in my research on donut economics in Amsterdam. So first, I'm going to share a bit about me that she didn't already say. Um, so I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the United States, and I was pretty much always involved in climate justice activism in my hometown which taught me a lot about how social and environmental issues intersect and why that's so important. When I was in high school, I got involved in a movement against an oil pipeline that was built on Native American land in Minnesota. And this really showed me how little the long-term well-being of people on the planet is often prioritized within political legal processes, especially in the United States, I would say. Um, no, it was still. <laughs> and in 2019, I read the book Donut Economics Kate, by Kate Rayworth, and I was very intrigued because this is the first time I started to think about how we need to change our economic thinking and our economic theories to try to encourage people in power to really prioritize the systemic changes that we need. And I wondered how ideas like this could actually be used in practice to promote more social and ideological or social and ecological resilience to issues like climate change. And so I then learned about how donut economics is being used now in cities like Amsterdam as a compass for policy change and change in local initiatives. And because Amsterdam is actually the first city to adopt this model, by the municipality and the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, I thought that it would be a good idea to come here and do research on it. And I started talking with Bill and Lucy, other professors. I designed the project and applied for funding and received it from Stanford. And that is why I'm here today. So yeah. Yeah, so a little bit first about the background of donut economics in Amsterdam, just in case not everyone is aware. So in 2020, the municipality decided to use the donut as a tool to make a city portrait of all of the social issues and the ecological issues that they need to address. And that's shown here on, um, this is the city donut. And you can see that there's a lot of areas where they're overshooting these boundaries of the donut. 
And uh, then the Amsterdam Donut Coalition was created by several people working at Havea, and they brought together many different change makers and thinkers in the city who wanted to use the donut to promote more social and ecological change. And then now you see the, there's a wide network of change agents, and there are 103 projects listed on the Amsterdam Donut Coalition website, many of which are local neighborhood initiatives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the research already done on donut economics in Amsterdam. There are two entrepreneurs who worked with the Donut Coalition named Cindy Stasi and Rieta Alarejo, who did an action research project in 2020 on the impacts of donut economics in Amsterdam, specifically about the donut deals projects. And they found that among all of these local projects, Donut economics can provide inspiration and help projects really identify the social and environmental goals they want to achieve. It can connect change makers in the city who want to realize similar types of change and promote a lot of really good collaboration. And it can also help projects evaluate their impacts and figure out how to maximize positive and minimize negative impacts. However, the literature does not delve in depth about what is actually happening on the ground in a lot of these initiatives, how people are interpreting and using the donut economics model in different ways, and the consequent social dynamics arising. So that's why I decided to explore the question of what social and ideological tensions are arising within donut economics initiatives in Amsterdam. And this is a significant research question, first of all, because within every social movement that exists, to my knowledge, there's always going to be tensions and disconnects, especially when you're working with such a holistic goal that's trying to incorporate many diverse groups of people. I also think it's important to explore the question about how academic theories like donut economics can help promote resilience to social and environmental issues like climate change, because there are such big challenges that we face. And this is a case study of, of this exact topic. And I think that that can shine more light than just having theoretical ideas about the importance of these things. So I'll talk a little bit now about my methods. So yeah, I did a lot of background research online before I arrived here. And once I got here, I realized that despite all of that research, there was so much that I could only really understand and learn about in person. And so I started to just attend um, a number of different events um, hosted by many local initiatives, some who were working with donut economics and some who weren't at all. Some people hadn't even heard of it, but this helped me really learn what was happening in Amsterdam in general and the various opinions that people had about the changes that are needed and about donut economics. I then identified specific groups that I was really interested in. I focused most on neighborhood cooperatives and sustainable food initiatives because I felt like these had really clear social and environmental goals. And they were also working with a number of diverse residents and neighborhoods, um, which is also really interesting. And then finally, I did some volunteering and participant observation with two different groups to really get a more in-depth understanding of how people were trying to create change in their neighborhoods and how they were working with residents. So for this presentation, I'm going to focus on several relevant examples just to help support my finding. But I wanna say that these are definitely not the only examples to support each individual finding. And there are many other examples that I just don't have time to talk about here. Uh, but yeah, these examples are, first of all, the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, which as I said before, is trying to connect everybody working with the donut in the city. Second, donut deals, which are more practical projects that are using the donut framework to highlight three social goals on the social foundation that they're working towards. and one goal on the ecological ceiling, and they're also engaging two or more partners. The third example is Bozo Park Amsterdam, which is a group trying to purchase a food park in Amsterdam West, 
that would be held as a commons resource for residents to gather and grow food on. And then the final example is AC Europe, which is a food justice group in Amsterdam that is promoting local sustainable food production and decreasing reliance on industrial agriculture. So now I'm gonna talk about my findings. The, I identified four tensions overall that I found to be the most notable showing up in multiple different examples that were unrelated. And these tensions are gaps between local and professional stakeholders, two, inclusivity specifically about who tends to be included and excluded from initiatives working with young economics, three, a disagreement about how much economic growth is needed in the city of Amsterdam to get into the donut, and finally, a contradiction about whether donut economics is a new or an old idea. So the first finding I'll share is gaps between professional and local stakeholders. And this is more about the big picture movement, what I observed there. And I saw this showing up most with the example of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, which is led by folks from academia and also entrepreneurs who tend to work with the donut on more of a theoretical level, at least from what I observed. And as I said before, they list many different projects on their website, most of which are local and grassroots. But when I talked with people from these local initiatives, they often shared that they were not aware of what the Amsterdam Donut Coalition is doing, and they weren't sure if they're even active. And it is true that the coalition is currently in a bit of a standstill, and they're, they're focusing on shifting their leadership, and they don't have a ton of funding. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to consider the fact that they do claim, at least from their website, it seems as though they're engaging with all of these groups, but that's not really what people are experiencing. And one person actually questioned the authenticity of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition because they saw that they listed all these initiatives on the website but aren't actually engaging with them. And they said they were worried that this may lead to the community becoming like a commodity. Another person I talked with had attended several events or meetups hosted by the Amsterdam Donut Coalition and did not feel very comfortable or included in the space because they said that this, these events were dominated by professors, people from academia, who were talking on a more theoretical level, and that this just didn't really speak to her or them, and they wanted to focus more on action rather than words. Among all the people I talked with about this gap, uh, a number of potential solutions came up. And one of them is for the Amsterdam Donut Coalition to shift their priorities a bit and to prioritize community building a bit more rather than just working with businesses and education. And really trying to share transparently what they can offer to local issues. The second potential solution is to have more authentic and transparent connections among those that they already do have, and to really start having honest conversations about the different types of change people want to see in the city, how they might want to use donut economics differently or interpret it differently, and the different ways that sustainability is interpreted to people. And the third thing is the coalition could better connect local initiatives to the city. Sometimes they will need resources or funding or um, more attention perhaps. And the Amsterdam Donut Coalition can serve as a good third party there. And then the final thing that I heard a few times was that the coalition could do some action research focused on these really big questions we still have about donut economics, like how do you evaluate the impacts of these projects and what does it mean to meet benchmarks on a social foundation or ecological support? So the second finding that I observed come up in various situations was thinking about inclusivity and who tends to be included from in these projects focusing on donut economics and 
who also tends to be excluded. And what I did talk with many people about is that donut economics can be quite an inclusive concept in certain ways because it's very holistic and it attempts to really be a change for everyone to try to get everybody inside of the donut. But because of the theoretical nature of the concept, it can be kind of inaccessible to everyday people, especially those who haven't taken as many or haven't gotten as many degrees. And many of the people that I spoke with said that it's difficult for them to explain the concept of the donut to everyday people. And also, a lot of people mentioned that when they try to explain it, they usually use the words healthy and green to talk about the changes they want to see instead of even explaining the donut at all. Additionally, I observed that using donut economics as a framework in several local projects can, in fact, widen power dynamics that already exist between people who are college educated and people who are not, and especially considering that some projects are taking place in neighborhoods where many people aren't actually college educated. And some people I talked with said that when academic professionals come into their communities or work in their communities and try to use theoretical frameworks, they think of it as like fancy language that's getting a lot of attention, but it can in fact sometimes obscure the tangible impacts that residents are already making which many times go unnoticed. So an example of this dynamic of inclusivity arising is uh, in donut deals projects, which often takes place in neighborhoods with Amsterdam residents, and they do have many amazing impacts that they've already created. I did talk with a few people though about a difference arising in how these projects impact residents when the projects are started by prioritizing what residents need and want versus starting by looking through the donut deal framework and through the lens of this transition out. So to explain that a little better, one person said that they really like to start these projects by learning about what residents need, the ideas that they already have about the change they want to see in their neighborhoods and that that often leads to projects that naturally combine social and environmental goals. And then the donut deal framework can be applied later on to get more attention for these projects or resources. But sometimes the projects have been started more with the donut deal framework as a guide, which sometimes because, like I said before, it can be inaccessible, it can alienate residents and potentially exclude people that would otherwise be or leaders in these projects. And this person talks about needing to fill that gap, which is difficult. So the third finding I will talk about is a disagreement about how much economic growth is needed in the city and whether this idea of degrowth or relying less on market solutions for the solutions we need is, is a good idea. And I talked with several people about the fact that potentially lowering consumption among Amsterdam residents in the city is important to get the solutions that we need to issues like climate change, instead of just relying on green growth to guide us. Um, and one example of deep growth occurring in practice, which many people in Amsterdam are already working on is commons economy projects. And this is often when land is taken off of the market and held as a commons resource in which the resources are shared by residents. And usually it's used to grow food or can be used to, for people to live on. Um, and the city often doesn't provide much support for this because especially with the example of land, Usually it's hard for groups to purchase the land and they have to rent it out from the city in a temporary time period. And many people critiqued the fact that the city was not fully supportive of commons initiatives, as well as critiques of the city for being too pro-growth 
and relying on these pro-growth solutions that were not necessarily dealing with the issues at their source. And an example of this contradiction arising is in the project Bozel Park Amsterdam, which is a group in Amsterdam West trying to purchase a food park that would be used as a commons resource for residents to grow the food on. And in this example, the food would not necessarily be purchased and sold to residents, but they would instead grow food and share it communally, just to be clear about that. Um, and the city alternatively wants to use this piece of land as commercial development. So I talked to somebody from this project who said that if you look at it from a donut perspective, it seemed very obvious that it should be purchased as a commons resource to grow food on, and that using it for commercial development would not necessarily add value to the area or to people. But I talked to somebody from the city who said that you can't necessarily say it's not donut to develop the area and that there may be aspects of donut economics that are in favor of development. And so, the, yeah, this is an important example of this idea of degrowth versus growth, because if this, this area is used for commercial development, it would be promoting more economic growth in a city, but if it's used as the food park, then it would not be promoting economic growth at all. So the final finding I'm gonna talk about is a contradiction about whether donut economics is new or an old idea. And in the book about donut economics by Kate Rayworth, she says that although donut economics calls for a radical new starting point for 21st century economics, in many cultures, these ideas are not new and they're actually foundational to many indigenous worldviews. And although this is stated and acknowledged, by her, I did find that in most of the groups and conversations I observed about donut economics, that indigenous knowledge was not acknowledged. And I talked with several other people who were slightly skeptical of the fact that these donut economics initiatives were not discussing indigenous knowledge, and that if we really think about, you know, the fact that indigenous people preserve 80% of the world's biodiversity, that we should really think about giving more land back to indigenous people as a solution. Although the Netherlands does not have its own indigenous population, it is very connected to indigenous people as well as formerly colonized countries because of its role in colonization. And I talked with a number of people who felt that the Dutch need to do more to acknowledge their role in colonization and to really try to actively repair some of the harms colonization has caused. And one way that this could be, be, to start to be done is for donut economics initiatives to start giving more credit to the knowledge and solutions that already exist in marginalized communities. So an example of a group that is attempting to address some of the harms caused by colonialism is AC Europe, which is a food justice group based in Amsterdam, trying to promote local sustainable food production and decrease reliance on industrial agriculture. And this group, one of the projects they're doing is creating a common seed library in Amsterdam, which would be a way to produce and share seeds locally without necessarily purchasing them. And this summer, they hosted a number of events called Seed Circles, which were focused on the cultural significance of seeds. And one event that I attended was focused on quinoa and amaranth seeds. And those are native to South America. A woman from Peru who attended the event shared stories about the cultural significance of these seeds and also talked about the harms that the current exportation of the seeds is causing to native Peruvian people. Everyone at the event was encouraged to try to source their seeds locally and to no longer buy them from industrial agriculture sources, which is contributing to exportation and thus the exploitation of native Peruvian people. And one of the bigger goals that a seed is working on is to purchase seeds directly from indigenous people and thus help them gain resources to get their land back. 
And I think this is important not only because it is trying to address some of the harms caused by colonialism and build stronger relationships with indigenous groups, but also because it helps to answer one of the questions posed by the city, Amsterdam City Donut, which you can't really see here, but it says, what would it mean for Amsterdam to respect the well-being of people worldwide? And this is something I wanted to bring up because I talked to several people working with the donut on a more theoretical level who weren't really sure how to start answering or working on this question. But I think it's really interesting and important that you can look at grassroots groups and their projects like this one and start finding ideas for how we could answer this question and aggregate impacts like this to make a broader impact at the city level. So now getting into my conclusion, um, I first want to say that, you know, although I've identified these four tensions here that I observe, this is not the full picture of donut economics in Amsterdam and its implementation, and it's not even the full picture of my own research projects. And I actually plan to expand on these findings I've shared here in a report that I will be writing with a professor at Stanford this fall. And I hope to ultimately make that accessible to as many people as possible and to keep sparking further conversations, research, and just thinking about this in general. And I also have four takeaways that I want to share from my research overall that kind of encompass all of the tensions and the examples that I shared. And these are one, to try to adapt donut economics as a mindset that can be shifted and adapted to local contexts and communities in various ways, instead of trying to enforce the model in similar ways in different places. Second, I think it's cool that donut economics can be used as a tool to really learn about all of the cool things already happening and to support projects that people are already doing or want to do that wouldn't otherwise recognize. Third, I think it's important to be mindful about power dynamics to realize that using academic theories like donut economics can in fact widen power dynamics that are exist, especially those between college educated and non-college educated people. And I think it's important to try to work with people and not for them. And then finally, I just wanna emphasize that it's really, really good to be transparent about disconnects and tensions like these, because like I said earlier, they will inevitably arise in every social movement, especially those that are trying to bring together so many different types of people. And sometimes when they're pushed under the rug or ignored, they will end up coming up again in the future and it can end up alienating more people or pushing them away from your movement. And alternatively, when these honest and sometimes hard conversations are had, it can really help to tap into people's diverse strengths and ideas and hopefully bring more people in in the work. So those are all the things I want to share. And now I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, I'll give people like a little bit to think about it, but also even if you don't have questions, I'd love to hear specifically what you would like to learn more about or what you think would be most helpful to expand on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Extremely interesting uh, talk. Uh, I think actually Kay Ravens should have been online with us uh, today. Um, mm -hmm. yes, I think she would love what you have in this with and your findings. I'm very deeply impressed. Uh, I think we can really learn a lot from the way you address the whole, uh, your whole research and the findings you bring. Um, so yeah, wonderful, brilliant. And I think the Donut Coalition, well, they can use you as a consultant to how they can, you know, um, perhaps uh, not uh, um, Impose model in the way or do a bit more and, and, and in a different way uh, so to create some less tension between them, you know, people who are feeling excluded. So, really wonderful. Are there any questions for Sophia or comments or ideas or anyone would like to add anything? 
Yeah. Um, I was wondering, and that's for the, the first, uh, like the gaps. Yeah. You yeah. provided a list of uh, solutions that you have yeah. not with. Uh, but for the others, I didn't see specific solutions. You had the takeaways. Yeah. Did you have like solutions linked to the different uh, tensions as well? No, because for the first one, those solutions came up when I talked with people. So those weren't my ideas, but they were things that other people shared. Oh, yeah. But then for the other ones, people didn't share ideas for solutions. And I also just think these are all very complicated and, you know, there's not going to be simple solutions. So I think more exploration should probably be done about that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Sophia, I was also very much impressed by your work. It's such a short time. Uh, you come with this uh, very uh, powerful analysis. So thanks for that in the first place. And it made me think, oh, I have to let it sink in more, I think. But my question to you would be, do you think that Amsterdam uh, is now a better city thanks to the Donut Coalition and embracing the donuts? Or should we conclude that maybe it doesn't matter so much because you say that people are already doing a lot of things, there are already bottom up things, maybe even the academics coming in and framing it as don't that make things even more complicated rather than really no. making a, a contribution on the ground? That's a good question. Yeah, and I know this presentation focuses a lot on, you know, some of the, I guess, maybe negative sides of it, but I don't think that that means that it's overall a bad thing at all. And I actually feel like it does add a lot of value. Uh, and this is something I want to expand more on in the report, but I thought it was really cool how it can be used to connect people who are thinking about it on a more theoretical level with grassroots projects, because it can be used as this like common language that you know, maybe it's not accessible to everybody, but it also can connect a lot of people. And I think when it's adapted, it also can really shine a lot of value on things that already exist that otherwise maybe wouldn't be noticed or seen as so important, and then show how they can contribute to bigger macroeconomic changes or citywide changes that need to happen. Um, yeah, I feel like there is a lot of potential for it still. And I, the thing is, it's so new that it's like, there's no blueprint for what to do with this. And people are just figuring it out. And I think that's also an important thing Kate Rayburn talks about is you just got to experiment and see what works and you're going to make mistakes, but you got to keep trying again. But it's so clear that we need tools like this to connect a lot of different people and try to think about the solutions that we need to set these big issues we face. And yeah, I think this can be for that. I think it, the, the models are sparks of the discussion. Yeah, I think just uh, like you say, you, know, you reframe it from model to mindset. Yeah, uh, that would really help mm -hmm. uh, to make it more inclusive and really bottom up uh, mm -hmm. initiatives. Um, so that might be the next steps that we could uh, concentrate on, uh, both within our own center for economic transformation, but also for the donor coalition. Yeah, and I know Rose is watching. So, because uh, mm -hmm. yeah. also, I mean, like, I think I was really interested in this because in the U.S. We're not really having any conversations at the academic level about how to change economics. And it's something I get really frustrated about in my university um, that I can't even take an economics class that talks about stuff like this. And so the fact that there's anything, any conversation like this happening at all, I think is really important and it needs to happen. But then when you start saying, okay, we're gonna include local people, we're gonna include everybody, it's like, that's really hard to do. Like, especially when there's already such disconnects we have in our society. It's like, you can't just have one magic model that will do it all. Um, and so that's why it's like, I think that talking about some of the disconnects and gaps is like really important. So it just shows, okay, like this is gonna show us things that already are gonna exist either way, but that we can, we can look at it from, a different way now that we've done economics and see what we can do better in general. Thank you very much for your beautiful work. And um, I have um, uh, one uh, remark. I, I meant with uh, the, the, the going from mind to, mm -hmm. from model to mindset, because Kate never uh, said it is a model. Yeah, it's, she did. 
it's quite simple. It's, mm -hmm. it's a mirror for you and me. Where I have it, yeah. How how is it going for me for you? And and it's different, and we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about stand still the donut competition, and I don't know if you know that there's 18 October. Uh, I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it is. Yeah, uh, that is by the donut colonies. Yes. And uh, I understand what you mean that it's it was in a sense, yeah. well, but it's actually yeah. quite active at this moment. And they are working on developing new donut deals with the whole city and with the rest of the Netherlands. Right. Which and is international. Yeah, so I've been talking with Rosa, and like when I first talked to her, she hadn't started her new position mm -hmm. yet. So she was just telling me about some of the things that the coalition was going through or they had this break for a while where no one was working it and now she's taking it on. And so then I've had several conversations with her about her plans for the coalition. And she's actually really wanted to hear feedback as well that I've gained from people. And I think it's amazing that she had these big dreams for it and started to think of it again. Yeah, so I'm excited to see what happens with that. Yeah, and I would like to, um, to uh, uh, I just uh, Sorry. Emphasize, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, that that it is a complex model, not, yeah. not complicated, but complex, and that we have to work on simplexity, the next level of complexity, so that everybody understands it's about me and you and our mm -hmm. organization and our whole city and our whole region. So, and that's also the. the, the the reason why we worked on the donor deals because yeah. it's as simple as possible, but yeah. very disruptive. Yeah. And working on a democratic yeah. transition. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And I think also being happy with the local initiatives and really letting those thrive, huh? because mm -hmm. the more yeah. the initiatives, the bigger the, the impact will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, the real uh, what really happens in donor deals is that it's not only uh, local initiatives, but it is together with uh, local mm -hmm. governments, yeah, uh, partners, companies, yes. and so on. So then there happens a lot in what you also thought about uh, uh, if there is uh, angriness, it's good. Yeah, and yeah. Because there happens. The people are different people mm -hmm. are coming together. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Any more? Yeah, thank you. I, I loved uh, your presentation and I really agree with what everybody already said uh, about it. Um, um, yeah, really happy to, to be here to, to see it. And um, yeah, it just makes me wonder to see this in Amsterdam. I think it's so interesting to like zoom into a city and see what's happening and the tensions that arise. Like, a, it's a super interesting topic. Uh, and it just makes me wonder does the same happen in? Other places like in the Netherlands, outside of the Netherlands, uh, and you've compared it just now a little bit to the yeah. US. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot happening in the US, right? As yeah. In a grassroots yeah. kind of sense, but maybe not in the discussion, uh, as you say. Yeah. Um, but I just wonder, like, about other cities, are these common tensions or is it very different from other places? What are, what are your thoughts? Mostly somewhat similar. I mean, like I said, I've 